Uh, it's a pleasure to lay out today in, in a very preliminary way <laughs> some of the research findings I've made in now a few months on and off of spending uh, my hours in the reading room, which is back behind us here, in the voluminous James Walden Johnson papers. I'm writing a new life of James Walden Johnson, uh, a, a full life, cradle to grave, as we say. I'm going to take a similar approach that I did with Frederick Douglass in a recent biography. That is, I'm going to tell the full life in the order that it happened. I'm going to mix the private life with the very public life of this uh, late 19th, early 20th century African-American. And I will be mixing his uh, administrative leadership role, which was tremendous, with his even more important role as an artist, a writer, a poet, a novelist, an essayist, a commentator in about every genre that there is. Um, I want to say quickly at the outset that uh, though I'm going to tell this story in the order that it happened, I'd like to look for anecdotes in places to place my reader. And I don't know where that's going to be for sure yet, but one possibility is um, <laughs> August of 1916, when um, they held the first Amenia Conference. This is upstate New York, uh, Joel Spingarn's uh, uh, famous estate. It was, a, it was a big retreat held to, in effect, reorganize the NAACP or to reorganize efforts to improve race relations in the United States and the, and the fate of African Americans. At that Amenia Conference, among the many dozens of people attending, were James Alden Johnson, all the leadership of the NAACP, lots of black leaders, and they all stayed in tents for three nights. And Johnson shared a tent with W.E.B. Du Bois. Now, I don't have the details yet of that tent life for three nights. Uh, I'm going to dig and dig and dig. I found this anecdote in a book on the NAACP by uh, um, uh, Pat Sullivan. Uh, the marvels, a huge history of the NAACP. But I'm looking, I'm looking for that. And just the idea that James Walden Johnson and Du Bois are living in a tent for three nights, just the two of them. We like to think of Du Bois as being much, much older than Johnson. He wasn't, he was only three years older. He was a kind of a mentor to Johnson, but they were almost the same age. At any rate, it was right after that Amenia conference that in their correspondence, which is quite extensive between Johnson and Du Bois, Du Bois writes to Johnson, November 1, 1916, says, quote, I think you ought to consider very favorably the proposal of Spingarn, he was the head of the NAA, that you be a candidate for organizer. At first, I was rather afraid that this would not be in accordance with your real life work of literature. But I am inclined to think that contact with human beings will be an incentive rather than a drawback to your literary work. Then too, you will remember the secret organization that you and I talked about some time ago. I'm not quite certain yet what that organization is, but I'm gonna figure it out. There is no telling what your wide acquaintance as organizer might not lead to. We might be able to tie a durable knot to ensure the permanency of the main organization. And finally, I would expect your field correspondence to be an interesting feature of the Crisis Magazine. Anyway, Du Bois then puts him forward to become field secretary of the NAACP. And that's what happened. And a few years later, he was made executive secretary of the NAACP and will hold that position throughout the 1920s all the way to 1930. James Walden Johnson was the head of this most important civil rights organization in American history. And indeed, in the early 20s, 1920 and 21, will lead their campaign for the anti-lynching bill in the U.S. Congress, which failed. And while I'm on Du Bois just a moment, in this wonderful correspondence between the two of them, 
just to show you here that Johnson did not really back down from anybody. Uh, he had tremendous respect for Du Bois, to say the least. But he sent critiques to the great Du Bois. There, uh, du Bois produced in the wake of the failure of the uh, dire anti-lynching bill in 1921, a manifesto with many parts to it, several parts. One part called power, another part called Democrats, another part called Republicans, and so on and so on. But Johnson writes him back and says, quote, I should think you should not refer to Warren Harding as a jellyfish. This is the President of the United States. I make this suggestion not because of any admiration for Harding or any particular reverence for the presidential chair. I think it is merely calling names. I'm saying to Du Bois, like, come on, you know, lighten up a bit, Will. Um, there's another point where, he's, where Du Bois is attacking politicians. He says, Johnson says to Du Bois, I believe, phrasing, dishonest politicians might be libelous. I would suggest office holding politicians. This is how precise Johnson could be politically. And there are many, many, many other elements of this long critique that he writes to Du Bois and I'll spare you. But uh, I know there is a lot of interest in Du Bois and uh, therefore I wanted to quote that. I also, you know, if James Alden Johnson has a reputation, and frankly, I'm not even sure that he does very widely, except among literary scholars, because um, he's just not that widely known. And one of my jobs here in these coming few years is to make James Alden Johnson as best as I can, not a, if not a household name, at least uh, much more widely known. Um, but he was extremely widely known in his own time, especially anyone in America who had anything to do with race and race relations. His colleague and dear friend, Mary White Ovington, who was one of the founders of the NAACP, in her book on, which is a history, it's actually a, a, a memoir, but it's a kind of a history of um, the NAACP called The Walls Came Tumbling Down. She says this about Johnson, and by the way, her chapter on the entire decade of the 1920s is simply called James Walden Johnson. She says this though, James Walden Johnson was well fitted to take his new position, brought up in Jacksonville, and for a time principal of a colored high school, he had moved to New York and made a remarkable success as a writer of lyrics for musical comedy. And seven years of this work, he entered, and after seven years of this work, he entered, entered the consular service. He went into the, the diplomatic corps in Nicaragua and Venezuela. Capable of deep imagination, she says, he yet had the quality that Matthew Arnold desired for all of us, quote, sweet reasonableness. Now, that's Mary White Ovington's take on James Walden Johnson. But a lot of people had that image of him that he was somehow the consummate man at the center, the man who could network and organize people and bring very disparate people together to communicate. That's true, but he could also be a brutal critic. And above all, I'm trying to say, and I do believe this will be a, a central thread of my biography, he was a writer. And I wanna, I'm just gonna show four documents here today that among the thousands actually in the collection. And the first one I wanna read a little piece of is a letter. Um, I'm always thrilled in the, in the piles of letters when I get the brown paper because those were the carbon copies. Uh, he's responding to a publisher who has written to him and asked him to record somehow his method of writing. It's 1934, Johnson writes back. It is a difficult thing for any author to say anything worthwhile upon how I write. What he usually does has no essential connection with the actual process of writing. Many of you out there are writers. See if this fits for you. For example, I can say that my first draft, I always write with a fountain pen. I don't do that. 
I use the ordinary commercial manila pad. I put a clip at the top in order to keep it bound while I am writing. The margin to the left of the vertical ruling I reserve for ideas, suggestions, or whatever else I think may work into the body of the text. When I am working well, I put in from five to eight hours a day. I write quite a clear copy because I generally think a sentence or even a page through before I begin to set it down. I do not think that any of this gives any insight into the inner process of writing. Perhaps the only hint that I can give of that is my method of filling my mind with whatever I am going to write about before I begin to write. I fill my mind by thinking on the subject, reading about it, talking about it, and reflecting upon it. I go on with this until the mind becomes saturated and begins to overflow. It is the overflow that I try to write down. I love that description when I read it. Uh, how often do we actually sit down and record how any of us write? Uh, I want to show, I wanted to show a couple of documents here from two famous writers. Um, this first is Zora Neale Hurston. Uh, Johnson has a course, a rich correspondence with Zora Neale Hurston in the 1930s. Um, it's right here in front of me. I guess you see that now. Uh, sorry, I'm just scrolling down to where I have it. Here it is. Um, she, by the way, has sent him, that's not what this letter is about, she has just sent him a copy of a new novel she has written uh, in 1934. This is before their eyes are watching God. She's not quite the famous Hurston yet. And she sends him a copy of a new novel called Jonah's Gourd Vine. And Johnson shies from no one. And he actually loves Zora Neale Hurston's writing by and large, but he writes her back this little letter. I've read your novel and have written a word to the publishers about it. I read it with great delight. It is a good story, a real story. It's well done. You have greatly improved, both in your grasp of life and in your technique. I hope the book will have a large sale. I'm using it in my class here at Fisk. Now that's a positive letter, but how many of us would Imagine the audacity to tell Zora Neale Hurston, at least in retrospect, you've improved your grasp of life. Um, he shied from criticizing no one. Uh, this next document I want to show, and I'd actually like to hold it up if I could. This is uh, Gwendolyn Brooks writing, who became the great Gwendolyn Brooks later, the poet who won the Pulitzer Prize in 1950. I believe the first woman ever to win the Pulitzer for poetry. And, and she had great respect for Johnson. Uh, she sends him, for, it's, it's written here at the top, for James Weldon Johnson, my ablest critic, Gwendolyn Brooks, a little packet wrapped in purple string of her poems, her most recent poems. They're all quite short, typed as though it's a little book. What does Johnson do? He goes through, and Tobias, if you can possibly show that page, he goes through and he labels the ones he thinks are good. <laughs> Puts them good, but not in very many of them. Uh, and then he writes to her and he says, uh, forgive me, I'm, I'm scrolling to, oh, I had it right here at the top. Oh, here we are, yes. Uh, with this lovely presentation of her poems, he writes back to her. Uh, I found several of them good, but I must be frank and say to you that I did not find anything sufficiently outstanding to interest a first-rate publisher. <laughs> At this point, it is very difficult to find a publisher for poetry unless the poet is well-known or one whose work shows extraordinary quality. Now, this is Gwendolyn Brooks. Uh, then he goes on another line. He says, I read some more of the poems and quote, they are not bad. Uh, he says, I have labeled each one I like as good. 
Now, she writes him back a grateful letter uh, as though she really needs to hear this. She doesn't want just effusive praise. I show you these just as examples of what became an enormous pattern in Johnson's life. And this will be my last two points. First, that Johnson became, yes, he served in all kinds of walks of life from being the early lyricist on Broadway for five to six years with his brother Rosamond, and went into the foreign service for uh, more than four years in Central America. He was an incredible newspaper editorial writer for the New York Age in the mid-teens. Um, and then all this work for the NAACP, he, he, con he uh, compiled the great anthologies in the 1920s of American Negro poetry and American Negro spirituals, the second edition of the poetry volume, and kept writing poetry, books of poetry, famous book in 1915 called 50 Years uh, Later, God's Trombones, uh, which was a huge hit, especially among people who had experienced the black church. Um, and then one of my favorites of all of his poems, uh, which we'll show here in a second, uh, St. Peter relates an incident at the resurrection. But before that, I wanna simply say, he became possibly the single most important African-American cultural broker. That is, he was a critic a go-between, a mentor, uh, go-between with publishers in particular. He, he, he had major access, his own publishers, uh, uh, Harcourt Brace, uh, Viking, uh, and other major trade. He got black writers into trade publishing. Now, there were other brokers in what we've come to call the Harlem, Harlem Renaissance, although I've yet to run into any document where Johnson himself ever called the, the 20s flowering of black literature, art and culture, the Harlem Renaissance. He never called it that. Elaine Locke, of course, was another of those brokers and compiled and produced the famous The New Negro volume in uh, 1925, was it 24? Um, but everybody went to Johnson. Langston Hughes, Sterling Brown, Aaron Douglas, Gwendolyn Brooks, Claude McKay, uh, William Stanley Brathwaite, County Cullen, W.C. Handy, uh, Zorling Hurston, George Schuyler, Roland Hayes, the famous tenor, the famous opera singer, and on and on and on the list goes. But so did lots of ordinary people, uh, actually hundreds of ordinary people. I'm going to confess to you today that I am, I am only halfway through the alphabet of the collected correspondence of James Weldon Johnson. And I have already encountered dozens and dozens of ordinary people, often very young, sending Johnson their short stories and especially their poetry. And he reacts by telling people his honest uh, criticisms over and over and over. If somebody uses a ridiculous cliche or a metaphor in a poem, he tells them that. If they don't seem to have any training, he tells them that. If they don't understand poetic technique, meaning meter or stanchion or any other techniques of poetry, he tells them that. He gives them reading lists. He tells them who to read. He sometimes will say to them something as blunt as, you know, you have some poetic sensibility, but I'm afraid you need to try something else. <laughs> and I don't mean to laugh about anybody's ability here, but what, what it showed is that he had a high standard uh, of his own training. And some people thought he was a bit old fashioned. Some people thought, actually Elaine Locke thought, um, Elaine Locke called Johnson's um, collection of American Negro poetry done in the mid twenties, uh, quote, moribund, and I've yet to find a response where Johnson answered that. He did have an older, kind of older world, if you like, conception of poetry, and he would often send people back letters. First of all, it's astonishing how many of these people he responds to. He cares about them. And by the way, sometimes 
he writes back and says, I like your work and I will help you find a publisher. And he tries. Publishing poetry has never been easy. Um, but he sometimes simply writes back and sends them a book to read or sends them a title. Or he says, you know, try reading some Robert Burns. Try reading so-and-so, try reading so-and-so. Uh, he even said that to Langston Hughes at one point, the young Langston Hughes. They had a warm, actually wonderful correspondence. Hughes was a lot younger. He looked at Johnson as mentor. And all of these people at one point or another, including the great Du Bois, went to Johnson for letters of recommendation for every kind of fellowship you could imagine, from the Guggenheim Fellow uh, Foundation, to the Rosenwald Foundation. And in many instances, some of these black artists lived on these fellowships. Langston Hughes was always broke and always writing to Johnson saying, can you help me get a Rosenwald? One time he writes to Johnson and says, can you help me get a, get a cheap Ford? Because I, I need to do a lecture tour in the South to make some money. And I think I can do it a lot cheaper with a Ford. And I don't know if Johnson helped produce a Ford for him or not. Last thing I'll present, because I know uh, we want to get to some Q&A, is this uh, book that is just beautiful in so many parts. You can see the title page here. St. Peter relates an incident uh, at the resurrection day. This is the title page. This is a poem Johnson writes and publishes in 1930. Um, not out of the blue by any means. It has several roots to it. Um, and I'll be quick with this. Uh, he had attended a, a gathering of Gold Star Mothers, uh, which clearly affected him because he says it in the book. And by the way, uh, Aaron Douglas did the illustration for the cover. He had a very interesting, warm relationship with Aaron Douglas, uh, who did illustrations for a number of his works. This poem is a long one. It's about five, six pages long. The story is this. And I think the real roots of it are Johnson's work against lynching, a lifetime of work against lynching, which had almost always failed, at least legally. And then his remembrance of the Ku Klux Klan march in Washington, DC of 1925. But in this poem, the poem begins with him describing how in heaven, everyone's tired out. The celestial choir looks worn out, they're tired of singing the same thing millennia after millennia after millennia. St. Peter himself is taking naps and falling asleep. And one day, some of the angels gather around St. Peter and, and just say, St. Peter, can you tell us one of the old stories? Just wake us up. You know, we're bored with doing this year after year after year. So St. Peter begins to stroke his beard and fondles with his keys. And he comes out of this story. He says, well, I remember a story. Yeah, uh, they were having the, this big Ku Klux Klan rally in Washington, DC. And the Klan was uh, invited to Washington. The Grand Wizard put out the call and all the Klansmen arrived and they gathered around the US Capitol. And I'm leaving out some of the best lines here because I don't want to read it to you. It's a long poem. And he said, then, then the Klan held a march and they marched and they marched and they marched toward Arlington Heights, Arlington National Cemetery, because they were going to the tomb of the unknown soldier. And they determined that day that they were going to resurrect the soldier in the tomb, which, by the way, had just been put there right after World War I. So this was also very much, in fact, it was put there the same time as the dire anti-lynching bill failed in Congress. So put those two memories together in Johnson's head. And, the, the, and, and finally, they get out to Arlington National Cemetery, and some of the men begin to work with axes and picks and hammers, because they're going to dig that, that soldier out and send him to the resurrection. And they dig and they chop and they dig and they chop, and they begin to hear the sounds of the soldier inside. He's helping them now. He's crawling out of the tomb. And then suddenly he appears. And I can't use the language that's in the poem uh, because of a certain word, but it's a black man. 
and the crowd turns into a mob. They go into a frenzy. They go crazy. And they try to rebury him. They kind of try to throw the, all the rocks and the stones back on him. But he gets away. And then the poem glides back to heaven where St. Peter is at the end of another sleepy day. And he's out at the fence at the wall. And he's about to close the gate, pearly gate. And somebody yells, one of the angels yells, oh, whoa, 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 there's a man walking up the road. And he looks out, and it's this tall black man walking toward the gate. And St. Peter opens the gate and welcomes him in. And it's a poem full of humor and terror all at once. It's one of the reasons Johnson had such a rich relationship with the poet Sterling Brown, who was a genius of using humor and folklore and terror in his poetry. Uh, but this poem that he publishes in 1930 by the Viking Press was published in only 300, I'm sorry, 200 copies, a special edition. 200 copies in, these, in this beautiful volume. And he gets dozens and dozens and dozens of letters asking how, how people can find a copy. Because they've heard about this poem, they want to read it, and they can't find it. Uh, it is now in anthologies all over the place. But at the time, it was very hard to find. But I have many examples of Johnson in his, his ubiquitous speaking tours, lecture tours, and reading tours of reading this poem. And then people would write to him again and ask if they might not get a copy. Uh, I would urge anyone who's never encountered St. Peter Relates an Incident to uh, pull it up uh, online or look in your anthologies and give it a read, if for no other reason than because of how it will remind you of what happened here in the United States on January 6th. I recently wrote an op-ed essay about this poem. Uh, that was published in the New Republic. Um, I'm just trying to get this poem more attention. I've run out of time. Uh, I've just tried to emphasize here a few of the documents and a few of the directions that a biography of James Weldon Johnson will take. And uh, thank you for listening, and I welcome questions.